Ah, it's been a while. Well, first, a big thank you to the clients who have been keeping me busy all spring and summer and all the way to the fall. I couldn't do this without you, nor can I do it with you. Anyway, I have a few days here, so I thought I could get some recording complete. But hello, and welcome to Vet Talk, the veterinary podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan. First, if you feel like reaching out and contacting us, there are a few ways to do so. You may reach out to our Facebook page, Vet Talk, the Veterinary Podcast, or you can email us at theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. Secondly, these episodes are meant to be free and informative to the general population. But if you feel like an episode gave you great benefit, I do have a website set up where you can show your appreciation of the knowledge at lickingvalleyvet.com slash vet talk. And a big thank you to our first donation. I'm sure it was really from Duncan, who appreciates me so much. But again, thanks for that donation, um, and that's helping me keep going with this podcast. And you do not have to contribute, but there are expenses involved in creating these episodes, and any payments are appreciated. So thank you again. That helps with making of more episodes. Today we are going to talk about horse parasites. In practice, this is probably one of the most common topics I should be discussing. In reality, it's not. It is really hard to get people to control parasites in their animals appropriately. And just as much as we are hearing about bacterial resistance, strains of parasites are becoming resistant as well to our anthelmintics, or what we normally call dewormers. Well, let's start at the beginning to see where we are today. First, what is parasitism? Parasitism is an association between two organisms of different species in which one member lives on or in the other member and may cause harm. Not all parasites cause harm. For example, on sharks, the remora is a parasite, but it actually cleans the shark, so they both benefit. When we talk about horses, the intestinal parasites, which is what we're going to talk about today, harm the horse. It's not a mutually beneficial deal. So on to internal parasites of the horse. I'm not going to spend much time on the types of parasites other than treatments for a few of them. I just want you to know that we are treating them. There are a few big types you might hear about. Um, We've got large strong jaws, small strong jaws, round worms, tapeworms, pinworms, and stomach bots. In general, large strong jaws are not a problem anymore. Once they're really big, this uh, parasite got in the horse and could travel from the intestine to a blood vessel and block that blood vessel. When the vessel was blocked, that stopped blood flow to the gut, the horse will basically colic and die a painful death. Thankfully, the drugs we have today pretty much have eliminated those parasites. They are still around, so we have to be careful they don't come back, but these parasites have not developed resistance to our dewormers, and the treatments we do actually prevent this problem, like 99 to 100% of the time. There are some talks in circles about the disease coming back because of how resistance and deworming schedules are changing, but right now it's not a big deal, and hopefully we can prevent it from becoming one. Round worms are worms that I see in horses under two years of age. The horses will genetically be able to not be affected by round worms when they get older. So we treat some of these in the beginning of life, and then we don't have to worry about it anymore. Well, unless there's an immune-compromised horse. And that's another option. Um, Ever seen your horse with an itchy butt? Yeah, that's probably pinworms. If your horse has a rat tail, I assume pinworms until proven differently. Our drugs usually kill these parasites easily. Um, Let's see. Ah, stomach bots can be a nuisance in large numbers, but generally die to the dewormers we're using and don't cause a lot of problems. Tapeworms you may think about more in dogs and cats, but are in horses as well. They can be a big deal and tend to live in an area of the horse intestine that is very small, the ileocecal junction. If they block this area of the intestine, it can cause colic and painful, horrible death. However, drugs today tend to be able to take care of these parasites, and if we continue to deworm properly, we just have to manage the problems that happen to arise. What we are going to focus on today is treatment of small strongyles. These worms are kind of wormy and are causing problems. Those problems are because drugs we are using to treat them, those parasites are becoming resistant to those drugs. So what veterinarians have to do is come up with a way to deworm and kill these strongyles while still protecting us from the other worms I mentioned. 
then probably the harder thing to do is convince clients how important it is to stay up to date on these new treatment methods that veterinarians are devising because we don't ever want the worms to get ahead of us. So, before we go any further, this is one of those areas that I have to stress again. Listen to your vet and their deworming protocol. Each region, even each barn I go to, can have a different parasite load and burden. We have to treat all of these uniquely. So I may have a different protocol for every barn I go to, and I may have a different protocol from a vet in Texas. Today we will tell you why you should listen to your vet and how we have gotten to the protocols which we use today. Okay, so I have a book here, uh, Diseases of the Horse, by the Department of Agriculture, um, and published in 1907. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, here, here's some pictures of some roundworms uh, and a pinworm. Um, and the bots I mentioned, ah, here we have some small strongyles, uh, but I don't recognize the scientific name they're using. Okay, but here's the treatment, and basically they say treat if the animal was looking unthrifty or if we see worms in the feces. Okay, so then we fast the horse. So no food, and I quote now, among the best worm medicine may be mentioned, santonin, turpentine, tartar emetic, creolin, infusion of tobacco, and bitter tonics. Tapeworms are best destroyed by pumpkin seeds. Okay, and it looks like this is a done ab about twice a day for two to three days. You can basically mix any combination of that stuff I just mentioned in water or linseed oil and get that in the stomach of the horse. I imagine by tubing it and putting it in the stomach directly, but I don't see that said right here. Um, well, I'm not sure where to start with this, because you know turpentine is a paint thinner, and on the, the bottle it says, do not consume. Tobacco is, well, tobacco, and not that I ever got in any habit, uh, it just sounds disgusting. Santonin is actually a drug to kill the parasite, or really, it just forces them out of the body because the horse intestines are caused to have such forceful contractions that it knocks the parasites off the gut's wall and then out of the body. So, none of that sounds pleasant. I wouldn't recommend it. And honestly, I have clients that I know still use tobacco to kill parasites in their horses and dogs. I mean, wow, right? That sounds caustic and painful. I don't like stomach issues in my own body. So when I'm treating horses, I don't want to treat them with something that gives them a pain I can easily relate to. Ugh, gosh, just makes me queasy thinking about it. Anyway, before we get too crazy and condemn people in 1907 for how they treat their animals, we need to take a step back and take a little look at what they're doing. We have to remember, at this point in time, we didn't have antibiotics. We don't have a microscope in every veterinary clinic. We can't look down at people in the past for using what knowledge they had available to them at the time. Often I don't look at people in the past as barbarians or uncivilized and uneducated because they used what they knew. I am often more critical of people in today's world. We have so much knowledge and information that we have higher standards of medical care now. When we don't use that knowledge is when I get upset. I remember once I got a phone call. It was from a guy who wanted me to do a dental on his horse. I'll explain more about dentals in another episode. I said, certainly, we can get that scheduled. Then he asked, well, you don't do that power dental, do you? Well, yes, I do. Well, I want you to do it the old-fashioned way. I'm sorry, I don't do that. I have better tools to make the job easier, and with those tools, I can do a better job overall. That man never scheduled the appointment, and I have never done a dental for that client. The news scared him. And I understand, new things are different, and we aren't comfortable with those risks. However, as society, we keep raising our standard of care and living. To a certain point, he was asking me to do this procedure with inadequate tools and without sedation, causing a safety risk. Sure, if I lived in 1900, I would do it that way. No problem, no questions asked. But I live in 2017, so I'm going to use the skills and technology I have now to do the best job possible. And that's something I run into a lot where clients want an old way and I want to do a new way. I'm not saying compromises on certain things can't be reached, but we live in 2017 and when we act like it's 1907, that is when we have a problem and we could call ourselves barbarians. In 1907, they didn't have these sedatives and power tools to complete a dental procedure, so they used what they had. When we don't use what we have, that makes us more barbaric. 
because we could do better and we choose not to. Uh, I guess I'll get off my soapbox. As people, we constantly have to balance the old and the new. Sometimes the old way is better and sometimes the new. Really what I see is sometimes it needs to be a mix of old and new. There are sound principles to both. Hopefully you will see why I went on this particular soapbox tangent in a bit. So we need to keep moving forward. The next thing we need to discuss is classes of dewormers. We have three types. Macrocyclic lactones. These are ivermectin-based products. Pyrim pyrimidines. I can never say that. Benzimidazoles. And those are your panicures. Um, or your finbendazoles. And that's all we've got. We don't have anything else. Unless we go back to 1907 and use tobacco and pumpkin seeds. Thankfully, these three classes work really, really well. These things kill parasites. And like I said, we start using them and we don't have problems with large strongyles. We see a pinworm, we kill it, giving the worm a horrible, painful death. Ha <coughs> ha, turnabout's fair play, worms. Tapeworms can cause issues, but we can still kill them and give the worm a horrible, painful death. <coughs> the issues are honestly with people who don't deworm their horses. These drugs work well and we use them. It helped our horses immensely. It kept them from dying horrible, painful deaths. I really like these sounds. So in the 1960s, veterinarians came up with a plan. Rotational deworming. Every few months we used one of these types of dewormers. That way we killed all the parasites and the parasites couldn't develop resistance because we used a different dewormer every few months. Well guess what? That sort of worked. I mean it killed well for about 40 years. You know, long enough that two generations of people got used to doing a rotational deworming. We got in a habit, and unfortunately that habit has bit us in the butt. I'm going to have to explain. You deworm a horse. We'll say back in the 1960s, this dewormer drug killed about 99% of the parasites. 1% survived. They didn't do too much to the horse, that 1%. But over the years, genetic abnormalities or differences in the worms slowly started producing more worms that were resistant. After so long in evolutionary terms, you're going to have a few worms that are born with natural resistance to the dewormers. Guess which worms live? You got it. Those wormy, abnormal freaks of nature are the ones that survive the dewormers and then reproduce, and then the horse would poop out his babies. Aren't parasites just gross? Well, that didn't matter too much. I mean, in a few months, he just came along and killed those remaining worms with the next class of dewormer on your regular rotational deworming. Those worms weren't going to be resistant to all the dewormers, right? And if we rotated every few months, those worms wouldn't have enough time to cause problems in the horse before we killed them. Well, that worked fine for a while, but then 30 or 40 years later, we started getting resistance to every type of dewormer. Because that 1% of survivors kept growing, and eventually worms that had resistant traits to all dewormers started appearing. So that 1% that we killed every few months wouldn't die. And then you have 10% of the worm population resistant. Then 20, 70, then 100. And then we had nothing left to treat with, and all the horses died horrible, painful deaths. <coughs> um, okay, well, we really aren't that far along yet in the horse world. In the goat world, parasite resistance is the biggest problem goats have. Goats are dying from parasites left and right. And they are dying horrible, painful deaths. No sounds here because it's happening. The drugs we use to kill goat parasites don't work anymore. So we have started double dosing goats, then that stopped working, then we start dosing two types of dewormers together. Now that has stopped working. There are goats dying in the United States today because we have no drug that can kill the parasites in them. That's why I'm so harsh on horse owners, because I don't want to get to that point. Right now on horses, we are in a battleground. I know with Panicure in a horse, I have to use a double dose. The recommended dose doesn't work anymore. I find in the region that I practice, Ivermectin works well, but I have practiced in areas where I've seen entire barns resistant to Ivermectin. And even the next generation of Ivermectin, Moxidectin, doesn't work. That's a problem, because if we don't change things, we will soon be like the goat world and losing horses left and right to horrible, painful deaths because we can't kill the parasites. So, vets to the rescue! When I started undergrad in 2002, they taught me rotational deworming. When I started vet school in 2006, they taught me strategic deworming. So the shift in thinking is recent. We had to come up with a way 
that we could save our dewormers and make sure they work. So instead of doing a shock and all rotational bombing effect of parasites, we went, if you will allow my military analogy to continue, to a cruise missile target at deworming. Basically, vets sat down and studied the life cycles of these parasites and how the worms reacted to the different dewormers. To do that, they had to measure how many worms were killed when they dewormed a horse. Hence, fecal egg counts. Guess what? That's a test I perform and want to perform on every horse. When you take your dog to the vet, they likely run a fecal and tell you they see parasites and then you deworm. Well, with a horse, we now recommend running a fecal and getting a number of parasites. Or in reality, the number of parasite eggs per gram of feces. We correlate that with how many parasites are in the horse. Then after deworming, we run a fecal again, and we want to see a certain percentage reduction in the number of parasite eggs we see in the feces. From here on, I'll probably just refer to this number of parasite eggs as parasites. Technically, you could just have one worm that is really prolific, but in general, we correlate this to how many parasites are in the horse. Studying these results showed that certain dewormers were not effective anymore. Your white dewormer, your benzimidazoles, your Panicure. That's why I double dose with Panicure when I treat with it, because there's nearly 90% resistance to a standard Panicure dose. So where are we now? Well, from this we realized two things. First, it's very individualized how each parasite responds to dewormers. So the first thing is deciding which dewormer works. We do this by running fecal egg counts before and after deworming to make sure we see a reduction of the number of parasites. The second thing we did as vets is study the life cycle of parasites and how the parasites grow and infect our horses. What we found was we don't have to deworm all the time. There are certain times of the year we can deworm. So in my area, after doing this for so long, I determined that ivermectin was still very effective in horses. So what I do is recommend an ivermectin dose in the spring. I then 14 days after that dose run a fecal. If the numbers are low, I am happy. Uh-oh, you aren't following the protocols you just mentioned, Dr. Nathan. No, I'm not. I am using the data I collected from my region for a few years to determine this protocol. I know this drug will be effective in most cases. If I find high numbers, then I may run a few more tests and switch drugs around. That way I have one drug and use that one drug and none of the others, so now resistance is not building up to them. Unless I have a special case where I use a second drug. Okay, well, then I gave my dose of ivermectin in the spring, and the fecals were consistent with controlling parasites. So then in the fall, I do another round of ivermectin, but I add proziquantel to this, which will kill those pesky tapeworms I mentioned. Then in 14 days, I retest, see my parasite numbers are controlled, and I'm a happy person. Sounds simple, right? Uh-oh, I see a fecal here. Uh, the numbers are high at my 14-day recheck. What's going on? Well, here, let's look at the numbers from one of my barns. Fecal egg counts any number over 250 I will treat for parasites. I don't worry about the numbers below 250 because there are going to be parasites in the horse. They can handle it. They're big boys and girls. It what, it's what happens in a world filled with parasites. 0% parasites, while it happens, is an unreasonable goal. So this barn has 20 horses. This was back before I just did my post fecal egg counts, so I ran a fecal on all the horses. After running the counts, Four of the horses had really high numbers. Twelve of the twenty needed treatment. So I treated and ran another fecal and there was an acceptable reduction in parasite numbers except for four horses. Well, the parasites reduced approx appropriately, but their numbers were still high. What's going on? Then I looked at the numbers and saw that four out of the twenty, or twenty percent of the horses, were normal. That number sounds familiar. Well, guess what? Vet studies have found that 20% of the horses genetically will have 80% of the parasites in the herd. Wow, science at work again! That's consistent across the country. Those 20% of horses can't fight off the parasites, and they take them up and shed them easily. So how do we deal with this information? Well, I dewormed those four horses more frequently with a drug I know worked. In this case, three times a year. In the fall, when I rechecked, all the horses had lower number of parasites, and the only ones that needed dewormed were the four. Now, I still dewormed them all in the fall with everything because I want to have effects to kill other parasites, like the tapeworms, and the proziquantel did that. But what happened with this herd was instead of having to deworm 20 horses three to four times a year, we dewormed four horses three times a year and 16 horses twice a year. 
That also helped with feed bills, because when 20 horses have less parasites, that's less hay you have to feed to get the same amount of energy in the horse. Also, the horses are exposed to less chemical dewormers, so there's less chance of resistance to develop, so I can use this drug combination for years to come. And if it stops working, I have plenty more drugs to switch to. And though I haven't been practicing this long, if ivermectin resistance develops, then hopefully when I switch to my second drug and resistance develops, then the worms may have lost their resistance to ivermectin, so I can start using ivermectin again. Or in reality, the person I sell my clinic to could. We're actually noticing this in cattle. Resistance developed to the white dewormers in cattle. They haven't been used heavily for 40 years since the development of vitamin I, ivermectin. So here in 2017, cow parasites are becoming resistant to ivermectin, but we are finding since we so heavily used ivermectin that we can now use the white dewormers again because these parasites have no resistance to it. That's great. So these horses are more healthy. We are using less drugs to keep all these horses healthy than we did 20 years ago. And we have hopefully set it up so that three types of drugs we use can be used for many, many, many more years to come. But is there more we can do? Of course there is. Other things I do to help make us have to deworm less is simple stuff. Feed concentrate foods and hay off the ground. Horses eat grass. Parasites live on grass, and I would rather the horse have a few parasites than have no grass. Parasites get into the horses from the ground, but guess what? Parasites can only crawl a few inches up off the ground. So if you put your hay in a rack, there will be no parasites in there. If the horse eats where he poops, he's going to eat his own feces and his own parasites. Horses realize this. They know they live in a box, so they tend to have areas they poop in. They don't tend to eat as much from those areas so they get less parasites. When you feed off the ground, it just lessens the chance they will come in contact with parasites. With this, don't overstock pastures. If you have too many horses in a pasture, these horses will eat the grass they have, and if there are too many horses and they eat up all the grass, horses will be forced to eat in their poop zone. Also, rotate pastures. Extreme heat in the summer kills parasites, and extreme cold slows them down or kills them. So if you give a pasture a chance to be exposed to extreme heat or cold, it will eliminate some of the parasites in the pasture. That, with your feeding off the ground, reduces more parasites the horse comes in contact with. Lastly, for those of you who put your manure out from stalls, compost it. That allows extreme heat to kill parasites. I know a lot of people who don't compost and just spread the horse poop in the fields. I don't care if you do this, it's a natural cycle, but you need to compost first to kill the parasites, or you are just covering your field with parasites that your horse will eat. Anyway, it's 2017. We have all these simple and complex methods to control parasites in our horses. It'd be foolish to not take advantage of this knowledge. It makes our horses more healthy, saves us money, and healthy horses and healthy pocketbooks are what we are all after right now. A healthy horse lets us do what we want with them and pocketbooks that are full allow us to buy tack or gas or whatever else we need to do to get us where we need to go. I'm Dr. Nathan. Thanks for listening. I hope this information was helpful. It's as dry as can be, but probably one of the most important things you can do for your horse. If you want to reach out to us, you can reach out to us at Facebook or at email at theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to show your appreciation of knowledge you received for this episode, you can do so at lickingvalleyvet.com slash talk.